Right. So I don't know if people heard in the back. So the comment was, the sampling is not the traditional sampling in the domain. I have a signal and I sample at different points. Remember, the integrate and fire is taking a signal and integrating it. And only when that integral crosses a threshold do you sample. Okay? So that's what he means by sampling the range as opposed to the domain. Okay? And it's done in a non-uniform way and you have to do nonlinear analysis to sort of try to analyze it. Yeah. No, I don't think she had any stochasticity. This is a deterministic model. Okay, so looking at some of the results here, sensitivity. So she fixed, so for, she, she was able to fix like some parameters and basically for a given model, she can see sort of this curve trade-off between the cutoff frequency that you can track well and Q. Remember, the bigger the Q, the sparser the sampling, so the worse your performance is gonna be, right? Yeah. Final chord. Yeah. Yeah, so, so all you're receiving all these commands. In fact, that's kind of what's, I think, nice about the, the work is that the, the cortex is complicated. So lump that, make that LTI, and then adhere to what's going on in the more final common pathway before you hit the muscle. It's the alpha motor neurons in spinal cord that then send spikes to the muscles. And that's where she sits and resides and says, that's my neural computing in terms of Q, and I'm gonna compute that trade-off. Yeah, so, so what the question was getting at, sort of delays um, in responding to a stimulus. So let me, a couple of comments on that. So one thing that I kind of skipped over is there is a delay from brain to spinal cord, okay? So maybe 10 milliseconds or something, signals from the brain that finally get go down to the spinal cord and reach the muscles, there's some mil several milliseconds delay. That's not included in her model. So she assumes zero delay, okay? So she, but with that said, sorry, there you have delays in the brain. So for example, take vision. The visual feedback as you're moving is quite slow. The time it takes for light stimuli to hit the retina and get to the cortex is, and, and, and then give you the feedback perception is around 300 milliseconds, okay? So you have, it's very, very slow compared to the rest of the brain, okay? So you do have all these factors and delays that are completely ignored in this model. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. So with that, she can look at various sensitivities. So she pick some model parameters and just compute the omega C versus Q. You can get a curve like this. If you're below the curve, if your Q is, you know, less than this, if you're below the curve, then you'll achieve good tracking, okay? But if you go above the curve, you'll start seeing skip cycles, okay? And this is at least, again, reminding you qualitatively seems to match experimental data. But then you can ask, okay, what about sensitivity to other parameters in the model? What about your feedback gain? So as, you, as all of you know, most of the time as you crank the feedback gain, you get better and better performance. You get higher and higher bandwidth. And that's essentially what she's seeing in this curve here, again, omega C versus Q. As you increase the feedback gain, you're moving this curve up. So you're actually increasing omega C, and therefore you're getting faster. You're able to track faster and faster without performance degradation. She also did looked at how the bandwidth of M, this gain here, if you increase the bandwidth of your muscles, 
bigger, stronger muscles, faster mu muscle, you should be able to track faster. And you get that from her analysis as well. Okay. This one here? Yeah, so the feedback gain is this constant gain in the feedback loop of her model. Okay, so you just think of a just standard control system. If I increase the, the feedback gain, you're going to increase the bandwidth, right? Just in general. Okay, and what she's seeing is that as she increases the frequency, she's also increasing the bandwidth of the sensory motor control. She's seeing an increase in the bandwidth. How? Because as I increase the feedback gain, let's just take a high feedback gain being the red curve, she's getting a higher cutoff frequency, meaning she can track higher frequency signals. At, until you hit her high cutoff, that's when you start seeing skip cycles. So the more you move up this direction, the higher your cutoff frequency is, the faster you are, the closer to a cheetah you are. Okay? Same with the bandwidth of your muscles. Okay, so the, you're getting to a lot of interesting things that actually have been done with by Amy Bastian at Hopkins. She's a neuroscientist, does exactly those kinds of things, which she perturbs the feedback to make you actually perform better or worse. So yes, you can do all kinds of things that way. But there's, Right. You're going to get more in that. Yeah. That's right. Maybe your gain is. Less. Yeah. That's where. Okay. How about cerebellum? So she changes the PID gains in the cerebellar part of the model and shows that if you, you know, if you have higher gains in the proportional derivative, you get higher bandwidth. Interestingly, in cerebellar ataxia, it's been shown that these gains decrease in the disease state. So that is very consistent with, okay, if you decrease these gains, then your cutoff frequency reduces in the disease state, which means your bandwidth has gone down. And you definitely see these people are slower, they can't track, they have degraded performance. And this is getting to the utility of this work. What's interesting from the neuroscience standpoint point is medicine is you can deal with people potentially if you know that one of these components is compromised well why don't you if somebody asked about push pop right if something is compromised maybe I can enhance using something else right and so I think she had some videos here this is a stroke patient and the idea here is there's a stroke patient on the left a Parkinson's patient on the right you can see that these are disease state are very slow movements Right, you, and the idea is, can you make them not just move better, but make fast, agile movements like a normal, healthy human being? And the hope is that this type of analysis, you can do that through compensation. So here's an example. Let me get to this slide here. Here's an example where the disease state might correspond to an, a lower in the neural uh, uh, activity, right? You're decreasing the power of the neurons, and maybe what you can do is increase the muscle dynamics in such a way that you regain omega C. Okay, and you can do this. How do you realize that? Maybe with an exoskeleton or prosthetic that has force, uh, can generate forces and make you move faster. Okay. So I'm not sure, do you mean time in terms of how quickly you can move? So the, the, the speed of movement or response to react? Yeah, yeah, so reaction time and response, right. So it depends on the disease. So with cerebellar ataxia, they don't have uh, problems in the necessarily in spinal cord or muscles. They have an impaired cerebellum. And so there's a very particular part of the system that's impaired, okay? certain gains go down in that PID controller, and that's how you get the slow movement. It, depending on the disease and the area of the damage, you're going to get people who will be better or worse in these tasks. I don't know if you're getting at that. With that said, this is sort of getting at that.
because depending on the model parameters, right, the bandwidth of the K component, the M component, and even F, if you allow dynamics in there, that dictates speed, right? How fast you can react and respond is the function of the bandwidth of all those components and the whole system, right? So depending on the disease, that's going to dictate how fast or slow you are. Does that answer, I think? So, oh, you, oh, okay. So I don't think she's done any of that analysis. So I think the question is, if something gets uh, compromised, what's the most efficient way to boost uh, to get regain? We haven't done that analysis. So right now, we just, I mean, you also have to have access. I can't, if you have a damaged motor cortex, um, it's going to be harder for me to enhance your alpha motor neuron because I have to go invasive into your spinal cord versus just put some exoskeleton on your muscles. So in terms of, I mean, we're very far from translating any of these ideas into practice, but I would think that the muscles, given the accessibility, are going to be where you want to go in terms of compensation, okay? So, and she shows at least analytically through a simple compensation how you can increase the bandwidth when you have a compromised, say, um, brain. And that was her work. So um, what was nice about this, yeah, sorry. Training. Yeah. So like rehabilitation. So yeah, so there's people who have strokes, so people who have strokes. Um, will end up having slowness of certain movements, and definitely through rehabilitative therapy, they can get better and better, and it, presumably what's happening is that the neurons are either rewiring or retraining and learning. You're increasing that cue with therapy. You can view it that way. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we have we have a new grant to, where we propose this, and it got funded by the National Institute for Health. So we actually have a new collaborator um, who works with primates, who's actually going to test out this theory. So what he's going to do with his primates, he's going to train them to track all these different types of periodic inputs, and he's going to compromise, quiet the motor cortex by in, um, injecting a, 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 a chemical called muscimol, which quiets the neurons. So that's his way of quieting and compromising the brain. He's going to increase delays between brain and spinal cord through lidocaine. So he has ways to manipulate the sensory motor system in monkeys to see if we can predict degradation or enhancement of performance. And then we're going to do the prosthetic, the compensation by we're going to quiet some parts of their brain and see if we can recover omega C maybe through some neuroprosthetic. It's a combination. They're coupled. Everything is coupled, right? So, yeah. Yes? So, so yeah. So, well, pin the tail, you have no visual feedback, and you have... Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so, so, so that's a different goal. So that's a goal where you're trying to reach a target that's a fixed point. Maybe you have a final uh, point that you want to reach and stay there. And that's a different task than tracking a periodic signal. Um, you, I mean, so, so yeah, maybe you could formulate a problem where you define precision as your goal, right? So you want the, pr pr the error. Um, to be minimized, and there might be some way to characterize, you know, how whether your error is going to stay within some bounds or not as a function of all these components. And, yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
I've left out a lot of things. <laughs> Right, it's like a spring. Yes, that's M though. Yeah, I mean, then they're probably nonlinear. Are you talking about nonlinear models of this where you can just, or, or are you just getting natural frequencies that are oscillating? Yeah. Yeah, you can get, um, so you could, add, but you could add all of that to your, your model M. Now, if you have natural frequencies that are very high frequency, I mean, first of all, that's not humans, right? This is just not, we're not, we don't flap like that. You know, we don't have these oscillations by a single perturbation, right? I mean, when we have a command coming from our brain, we don't see things like high frequency oscillations in healthy humans. But you could put that into the model. I guess the point of the analysis is you put whatever M you want. If it's LTI, she has a way to compute omega C. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, you could put you could put it in the brain. You, I mean, in fact, I think in her mind when she was doing the analysis, I don't know if she separated Q being in spinal cord versus brain. But I mean, Now, whether the test occurs at the input of the model or after the process of the <laughs> well, what it, what can it, okay, so I guess to me, from my side, the way I would answer that is then what's the utility of that deep learning network? What can I do with that? So, okay, you can compute an omega C, but what's nice about her formulation is she sees the coupling explicitly, right? She can, she understands if I, how, if I increase these, how the others have to decrease. I don't know how to do, deal with that. From, Right. Mm -hmm. 
No, you won't get that. That's the thing. It can do it. But the data is an issue, right? I mean, you need good data. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're saying instead, of, so replacing the integrate and fire model with something that's slightly more mechanistic but still tractable, like a second order. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure if she added the, like a Fitz, Fitzhugh-Nuguma model, like a second order or something, capturing the slow, fast dynamics, I mean, it's more difficult to work with an integrate and fire, but possibly, I mean, I would think she could use potentially the same approach, I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's interesting what engineers want to do next versus what neuroscientists want to do next. And I know we submitted that grant twice going to a neuroscience review panel. And you know what they wanted? They didn't care about that. They wanted more detailed musculoskeletal model that's more realistic. They wanted more delays. And they wanted it to be more and more realistic so that they believe it, right? I mean, so, right, we're trying to. Well, we got the grant, so we'll, we'll see. So it looks like I'm going to stop. So unfortunately, I don't have time for epilepsy today, but I'm happy to talk about it offline if anybody wants to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening.